From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We get, begin today with an update on the Republican convention, just a quarter of the way into it now. And for that, we welcome Bloomberg political contributor Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital. So, Rick, welcome back. It's been so long since we've been together. Give us your take on the first <laughs> night. As I say, we're one day into a four-day convention. Well, I think it was uh, what we expected. Lots of Donald Trump. Of course, he showed up during the roll call to basically accept the nomination uh, for the Republican Party uh, as their candidate. And then there was a nice uh, piece that was produced, pre-produced in the Oval Office with uh, people who had been rescued as uh, hostages throughout his administration. Uh, and then, uh, and then later on in the evening. So uh, he's making good on his promise to be at the convention every day, in some cases multiple times. But I would say Nikki Haley uh, gave a stirring speech about her own personal experience uh, growing up in a, as a minority in a predominantly white community and uh, some of her experiences there. And, of course, uh, you know, Donald Trump's very muscular foreign policy and uh, how she managed that as the uh, U.N. rep. So I think those were, those were two of the biggies. Um, the other aspect of this was a, uh, a big presence of African Americans on the agenda. Vernon Jones, Kim Klasick, uh, Herschel Walker, Tim Scott all spoke yesterday and uh, gave their pitch to uh, why the Republican Party should receive more support in the uh, black community. Yeah, there was a lot of things that we expected, as you say, they were there. There was at least one thing that was not there. You referred to it, actually, toward the end of our coverage late last night, and that is the fact that there were there was rioting going on in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after an unarmed black man had been shot by police. The video indicates he was shot like seven times by a police officer. At the same time, the Republicans really make a lot out of law and order. A lot of people talked about the need to beef up our police. Wasn't much mention of what was going on, as they called out National Guard, actually. They called out National Guard. There was uh, a very uh, tense situation, obviously a lot of uh, destruction of property. Uh, but look, I mean, these are the things that were ignored, as you point out, at the convention, that uh, much of the discussion was about re re restraining these kinds of acts of uh, violence and uh, being, you know, Donald Trump being the law and order candidate. But virtually nothing was said by any of the uh, African-American speakers about social justice issues. And so different from the Democratic Convention, they left out this portion of the, uh, the program. And so you really wonder, were the African-American speakers at the Republican Convention trying to recruit blacks into the Republican fold, or were they just trying to give comfort to the predominantly white supporters of Donald Trump that, uh, that they were also okay you know, with this uh, with this approach to law and order. So uh, really kind of question what they were after. I thought the night was predominantly focused on the base, and, uh, and so we'll see where they go from here. Okay, Rick, thank you so very much. That's Bloomberg contrib political contributor Rick Davis. He'll be back with us tonight, actually, for our coverage of the convention, night two, which begins at 10 p.m. Eastern time. The Jacob Blake incident in Kenosha has reignited concerns over policing across the country and raised questions once again of how things like this can still happen. We welcome now someone with particular insight into policing. She is Diane Goldstein. She's board chair of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, a nonprofit organization advocating for criminal justice. Ms. Goldstein, early Earlier served for 21 years on the Redondo Beach Police Department. She rose to the rank of lieutenant. So thank you so much for being with us, Diane. Give us a sense of how does that happen. I mean, you've been out there. You've patrolled. You know how policing works. How do we have still the incident where we have uh, an unarmed black man shot seven times in the back? I, you know, the, I think it's a... Uh situation where law enforcement many aspects hasn't learned lessons of how to build relationships with uh, communities and, and in, in particular over police communities um, because of failed drug war policies, you know, systemic institutional issues. And I watched the video just like I watched the video of George Floyd and uh, Armored Arbery's death and it struck me that we continue to use state authorized violence to try to solve problems that police necessarily shouldn't be involved in. And uh, the, to further the issue is we don't have any mechanisms, mechanisms in place 
that really deals with after effects, like say, for example, the NTSB that goes in and does investigations after a plane crash that dissects what law enforcement could have done or the criminal justice system could have done to prevent that situation from happening. Do we put police officers and people who they're apprehending in a position where there's just no win for them, essentially, when you watch what happened? And we've only seen that one video. We don't know exactly what happened, but apparently there was a domestic disturbance. You had three or four police officers. They followed him around the car. He was getting to the car with his small children, actually, and then they shot him several times. At that point, by the time you get to that point at the car, are we already in the wrong place? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt that from the very beginning, the law enforcement officers lost control of the situation. And irrespective of what happened before the videotape of the shooting, the tactics that that officer took were incredibly dangerous. You don't try to grab someone by their shirts with a gun out. And, um, you know, you fired seven rounds, which um, I believe at this point, four actually hit the victim into a, a vehicle where there's children present. It's an incredibly dangerous situation. And, you know, part of it, I think, is a lack of training on how to um, really restrain people using the minimal force necessary. Sometimes that, that has to occur in law enforcement. There's a lack of training on de-escalation, communication, relationship building. Um, and I think on, on the flip side is, you know, you have communities that have seen just, you know, a deadly year with law enforcement shootings or the Ahmed Arbery shooting, which was a former retired law enforcement uh, uh, connection that uh, Breonna Taylor, you know, previously Philando Castile, where law enforcement has, in fact, not acted in a fashion based on training, you know, uh, ethics, sanctity of life. And we have to up in policing in order to fix it. Are we sending a message to our police officers that they have to rein themselves in? Because we have situations, certainly Chicago has been out of control from time to time. Right now in New York, we have so many shootings in New York City right now, you can't believe it. Is it possible to both keep the straight streets safe and also make sure we're not abusing some of the people we're trying to apprehend? Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's really, you know, kind of the uh, million dollar question right now. As we have these conversations of reallocation of resources into programs uh, that include mental health, violence disruption, um, you know, and, and other uh, evidence based programs that we know reduce crime and reduce the harms of the, the criminal justice system, we also have to work with um, all the public safety stakeholders, which includes the community and police, because if, in fact, you you steal resources away too fast, you're going to have a de-policing situation. And yet, even with the increase in shootings, what we're still seeing is that crime rate is, is very low as well. And, and I'm not trying to minimize um, uh, what is what is occurring, you know, post the, the, the protests. But um, I think that we have to be more strategic from a policing perspective, and we have to take a stand that, that we are part of the problem, we can be part of the solution, but we have to work with our stakeholders. You know, that's the thing that's been lost in policing for a long time is the criminal justice system has, has believed that they're the only experts on how to create community health and safety. And because of that, they right. have not been inclusive of all the stakeholders in the community right. to see how they want to be policed. It's a very complex situation. Right. We have to invest right. the money at front end right. and as well as back end. Right. Uh, Diane, I want to raise one specific thing because it came up at the convention last night, actually, which is called restorative justice that you know terribly well. And talk, get your thoughts on that. But I want to listen first to the father of that poor girl who was murdered at the shooting down in Parkland, Florida. And he actually spoke to the convention, and he said he thinks restorative justice is not the way to go. This is what he said. Far-left Democrats in our school district made this shooting possible because they implemented something they called restorative justice. This policy, which really just blames teachers for students' failures, puts kids and teachers at risk and makes shootings more likely. 
but it was billed as a pioneering approach to discipline and safety. So, Diane, as you know, restorative justice is a foot across the country. There are various initiatives right across the country. Explain what it is and explain why you think it might work, despite what we just heard from that tragic father. Well, restorative justice has a long history, especially in, in the juvenile justice system. And what you have to understand is restorative justice is about both meeting the needs of victims and it, it's based on uh, rehabilitation. And the reason it's been so, so su successful across the country, especially at the juvenile level, is because juveniles have the, the ability to change dramatically, as do adults. And um, what, we, what we'll see in the future, is, I think, is better investments in, into programs like restorative justice that allows people second chances. And I'm not certain what restorative justice had to do with the Parkland shooting. It, it uh, the, there were a lot of issues there, but I'm, I wouldn't blame it on restorative justice. Okay, Diane, it's really great to have you with us. It's particularly important today. It's Diane Goldstein, she's board chair of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Coming up here, what is President Trump's plan for the economy in a second term? We asked David McIntosh of the Club for Growth. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. First Lady Melania Trump will step into the spotlight at the Republican National Convention tonight. She'll make the case for her husband's re-election from the White House Rose Garden she just helped to renovate. Her speech during the 2016 convention was criticized when it was found to have included passages similar to what Michelle Obama said in her speech at the 2008 Democratic National Convention. A speechwriter for the Trump Organization later took the blame. In Kenosha, Wisconsin, a second night of violence between police and protesters, that's after a black man was shot Sunday by police in an incident caught on video. Police fired tear gas to try to disperse crowds. Wisconsin's governor, Tony Evers, deployed 125 members of the National Guard. Meantime, federal agencies are increasing arsenals of tear gas, sponge-tipped bullets, and other crowd control equipment as racial justice protests continue around the country. The government spent at least $28 million for the year since May 25th, when the death of an unarmed black man in Minneapolis, George Floyd, in police custody sparked protests. According to data analyzed by Bloomberg government, spending has soared 114 percent over the same period last year. In Spain, Pedro, the Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez is resisting pressure to order another national lockdown. Instead, he's asking regional authorities to come up with a response as coronavirus infections surge. It was his first public comment in three weeks. The number of daily infections in Spain hovered close to a four-month high last week, leading a surge across Europe. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Tonight marks the second night of the Republican National Con Convention with a focus on foreign policy and promise of opportunity. Bloomberg's chief Washington correspondent, Kevin Cerulli, spoke with RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel earlier about what to expect tonight. Tonight you'll hear from the First Lady, which will be very exciting. You're going to have venue changes every day. But the overall theme is this is the greatest country on earth. We love this country. And we want to have the opportunity and the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans available forever. And that's at risk if we choose a Joe Biden or a Kamala Harris. Now, swing state polls have the president trailing just behind uh, Joe Biden. Obviously, we're still a ways out from Election Day. He's still within striking district distance uh, in these polls. But on the issue of the economy, President Trump, according to the Wall Street Journal NBC News poll, is up by 10 percentage point, despite some disapproval in handling of the pandemic. When you look at those two issues, handling of the pandemic as well as the economy, 
Uh, how, how do you reconcile that and, and, and use the, the convention as an opportunity potentially uh, to tell the Republican story on the handling of the pandemic? Well, you've seen Democrats really try and politicize the pandemic and use that as a way to criticize the president. And I think most Americans recognize this has never happened in our country. It's a global pandemic. The president took decisive action, cutting down travel to China early on with the PPP loans, with the PPE that he's made available, with ventilators, with warp speed vaccines. So he's addressing that. But I think more than anything, as we talk about the economy, Joe Biden just said, I will shut down America again. I think that is such an elitist view. Not many people can afford to stop going to work right now. People live paycheck to paycheck. We don't see Democrats here trying to pass a stimulus bill. Instead, they're trying to pass a U USPS bill to make sure that they get elected again. They're not working on behalf of the American people. And when Joe Biden says we're going to shut it down again, you know who can shut down again? Hollywood celebrities and the politically elite. Most average Americans need this economy to continue growing. And that's what President Trump has done, balancing health and safety with getting the economy open. And on the issue, though, of the economy, you look at a state like Michigan, of course, Chairwoman, that you're incredibly familiar with, uh, the, such a key battleground state uh, in, this, uh, in this election. But you look at some of these suburbs in particular that are swing districts uh, that have gone blue in 2018, that, that if, if Republicans want to win, they got to win them back. How will the, the Republican Party try to make some inroads in, in those swing districts? Is it school choice? Is it uh, law and order? I, uh, both and the economy, school choice, law and order, and the economy are things that are going to help bring back suburban board voters, especially as they see jo uh, Joe Biden embrace the policies of Bernie Sanders that are very extreme. There's a reason why they didn't talk about these policies during their convention, because they know that they don't appeal to mainstream Americans. When you say we're going to give free health care to people who come here illegally, what does that mean? It means it'll create a magnet for people to come here illegally, and it will increase the cost of health care. When they say we're going to give away four-year colleges, four-year college degrees, moms in the suburbs, we know that's not true. That just means our taxes are going to go up. And you know what? Why don't you focus on getting kids graduating from high school before we give away free college? Uh, there's so many things that they're putting forward that aren't being vetted, and I think suburban women are especially are looking at this and recognizing Joe Biden's policies will bankrupt this country. So and that was RNC Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel with Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli speaking earlier. And a programming note now, we're going to have live coverage of night two of the Republican National Convention. That will start at 10 p.m. Eastern time tonight. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Republicans are basing much of their case for returning President Trump to office on what he was doing for the economy before the pandemic hit, raising a question of how much of that was deregulation and how much of it was that massive tax cut. When we started talking to business people, big and small, they were telling us we'd rather have regulatory relief than tax cuts. We're getting killed more with regulation than we are with tax cuts. So I don't know that we need another tax cut. I believe he thinks we do, and he knows more about it than I do. I, I sure know one thing. We don't need a big tax increase right now. We welcome back now David McIntosh, president of the Club for Growth. So, David, great to have you here. Do you agree with Rudy Giuliani that going forward in a second term, we don't need tax cuts so much as just more deregulation? Well, and Rudy's point out the big contrast, right? Um, Trump wants to have further tax cuts, and Biden wants to increase them which would uh, tank the economy. I, I think we need both. I, I think d more deregulation, he's exactly right. That will free up American businesses to get started again, hire people back. Um, it costs about 15000 per employee to comply with all the federal regulations. If we can trim off you know, a couple thousand or 5000 of that, that's more people they can hire back faster. Uh, but the tax cuts, I would target them to the folks who were left out of the last tax bill, the, particularly the small businesses who run it on their own tax form. 
they didn't really get a break, and they're the ones that are struggling the most in this shutdown of the economy. So I think there's there's a need for both, and I'm glad that President Trump's campaigning on both. David, if we really want to stimulate growth, wouldn't be coming to terms with China do an awful lot of good? Because if you look at the record for the first two years of the Trump first term, we were growing at a faster pace than Obama, but then it started trailing off before the pandemic, and a lot of people think that was because we were going to a trade war with China. That certainly affected the markets back and forth. I think there the president's got the long game in mind, and and we do need to get to good trade relationships with China. But they have to understand it, it's not going to be a one-way deal. Uh, they have to start recognizing property rights, intellectual property. Uh, they've started to open up where foreigners can actually own corporations there. To be a full partner in the world economy, they've got to join into the basic structures of free markets where private property matters. They have to give up that communist notion that it's all collective property. And that's what Trump's pushing for. And I think that that'll be good. Now, tariffs hurt us. So we, I don't think it's a great tool. But I think we do have to push China to get to a, a fair and, and reasonable trading position. David, one other thing that's come up during this convention, but I didn't hear much of for the first three and a half years of the Trump administration, was school choice. That's being featured really heavily right now. Where did that come from? Why is it all of a sudden so important? Yeah. So at Club for Growth, we've been pushing that for about a month, and it's a, a realization that a lot of people are facing a huge problem with over 50% of the students in schools that are closed or partially closed this fall. Parents, maybe where they're both working, uh, can't manage it all. And so we suggested when the schools aren't being helpful, they're not working for people, or in the inner city, they're just not safe, that send the money directly to the parents, let the parents choose what works for their kids. If they want to do distance learning in the public school but hire a tutor, let them do that. If they need child care, let them do that. If they want to pick a private school or a charter school or even a religious school, let the parents pick that. And what we realized is that's now more than just an inner city issue where the schools are in crisis. It's a suburban – it's an everywhere issue – that right. parents need to have the resources yeah. to deal with the schools being closed. Yeah, and something we're going to hear a lot more about, I think, for the rest of the week. Yeah. Many thanks now to We've David McIntosh. we hard. Yeah, okay, fair enough. You've been pushing it hard. We're going to hear a lot more about it. It's David McIntosh. He's president of the Club for Growth. Coming up, we're going to keep talking about President Trump's second-term economic agenda with former Republican Representative Daryl Issa of California. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Trump's economic record will be front and center as we move toward the election. And to take us through that record and what it could mean for a second term, welcome now former Republican representative from California, Daryl Issa. Mr. Issa is now running to return to Congress to represent the state's 50th congressional district. So, Congressman, thank you so much for being here. I I know you're a fan. Give us your best argument for why President Trump deserves to be renewed in office. Well, I think the word renewed is appropriate. Uh, The fact is that when President Trump came in, we had just had a long period of slow growth. Uh, He kicked it up uh, with a series of very smart moves, tax moves, policy moves, regulatory moves, and in fact, pushing uh, against unfair trade agreements. And what he did was restore America's vitality and growth. The pandemic has taken that away But in fact, the second term is an opportunity not just to restore and renew and reclaim that position of leadership, but to take it to a higher level. As we come out of the pandemic, quite frankly, if America remains positioned as a global leader the way we have been under the Trump administration, we're likely to get that competitive edge in lots of areas, but particularly in manufacturing something that was previously in decline. If you take a look at the first three years of the Trump administration, the economy, GDP, was growing faster 
somewhat faster, not dramatically faster, than it did over the average of the Obama years, without a doubt. It was at the same time that rate of, gro of growth was slowing down somewhat. Uh, are there concerns, particularly because of trade, that in fact we weren't headed for the 4 percent that President Trump promised us? Well, when you're, when you're hitting 3 percent growth at the end of what had actually been, you know, since 2009, uh, the longest uh, period of economic growth in modern history, uh, it's actually unheard of to have those kinds of numbers. So I think the first thing is you look and say, we were extending the cycle and increasing the cycle. But remember that the, uh, the, the deal with Mexico and Canada is now in place and it's beginning to bear fruit. But our real advances with China, either driving business out of China or driving China to be more fair or a little bit of both, it's still in its fairly early stages. But Europe uh, is certainly waiting for, to see how this works out because they've wanted to turn China from an unfair trader into a fair trader, but haven't been willing to do what President Trump has done, which is engage them straight, straightforward and say, you've got to play by the rules you agreed to. Congressman Issa, uh, at least some of that growth, a fair amount perhaps, was because of a pretty large tax cut that President Trump got through with Congress. In order to restore growth, can we afford that kind of tax cut again, particularly after we've had to spend so much money because of the pandemic? Well, there's no question at all that we've increased our debt and that debt service is going to uh, uh, be with us for a long time. But just as, as Reagan's tax cuts kept economic growth going for a very long time and allowed America to revitalize, uh, we can do the same thing. The fact is, if you, you can grow your way out of a deficit or you can tax your way out of it in hopes that it doesn't stifle growth. I always favor the former. Uh, I don't believe that we should be constantly changing our tax code. Right now, we have a progressive tax code in which uh, to be honest, the top income producers pay more than they have in a very long time, uh, virtually since World War II. You have the highest, uh, uh, you know, true uh, tax rate being paid. And yet the Harris-Biden, Biden-Harris team wants to dramatically increase it, add wealth tax. California wants to add a specific wealth tax. So you've got a, a group that wants to increase taxes higher than they've ever been before, versus a president who says, I want to reduce regulations and hold taxes at a, at a rate that we can afford and grow our way out of it. I think for most Americans, they buy it that we can grow our way out of it mm -hmm. and that, uh, that simply saying we're <laughs> going to stick it to the rich again, is going to end up with a middle class paying a bigger share once again. Uh, Congressman Issa, I want to turn to one of the things. The economy will no doubt be front and center this election, but also we're going to hear from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tonight at the Republican convention. He's going to be coming to us from Jerusalem. I suspect one of the things he's going to talk about is the normalization of relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, an historic development. Give us your perspective, because you know that region terribly well. You have roots, actually, in the region, in the Levant. I do. And, uh, you know, I've been going back and forth for decades there, uh, working with all the leaders in the area, watching the Palestinians fail uh, to take opportunities in the past and watching the Arab leaders fail to engage with uh, with Israel uh, and watching the Iran growth. And of course, under President Obama, uh, that revitalization of, of Iran by giving them one hundred and forty billion dollars uh, is still being felt. But under the Trump administration, uh, with Jared Kushner and, and obviously uh, Secretary Pompeo, this engagement uh, is two-part. It's an engagement with the Arab world, and they feel comfortable, but it's a lining us up against Iran in a way in which Arab countries have now made choices. They can choose to be with us and Israel against Iran, uh, or candidly, they can continue to live in fear of Iran. Uh, UAE has made this choice, but uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, many other countries are looking for a trigger uh, that's going to allow them to weigh in. But they're going to weigh in for two reasons, and this is what's been brilliant about the tactic is they know that, that being uh, aligned with Israel really means being aligned with the United States against Iran. And that's where most of the Arab nations want to be. 
Uh, it's certainly for, I'm of Lebanese ancestry, right. it's certainly what's going to give Lebanon an opportunity uh, to push out the effects of Hezbollah that have right. captured that country uh, for about the same quarter of a century plus uh, right. since the last time we had any breakthrough in the Middle East. Congressman, finally and briefly, I'm going to put you on the spot because you do know the region. Who's next? You know, uh, I believe that the statements coming out of Lebanon would, would be true, that they would be next, if not for Hezbollah basically being assassins. So it's likely to be in the Gulf. Uh, Qatar has uh, the easiest path, but I suspect that it's just as likely to be uh, Kuwait or even if they can do a deal with, uh, uh, as to the two-state solution, Saudi Arabia could well weigh in. And, of course, that's the big, uh, the biggest uh, push. Yeah, that would be massive. Thank you so much. That's really fascinating. That's Congressman Darrell Issa, former congressman from California, running to come back to Congress. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Hurricane Laura is poised to become a powerful Category 3 storm when it comes ashore along the Texas-Louisiana coast. Forecasters say it's threatening to inflict as much as $12 billion worth of damage on the region and potentially shut 12 percent of U.S. refining capacity for months. The National Hurricane Center says Laura will likely bring 115 mile per hour winds as it comes ashore late Wednesday or early Thursday. Hundreds of thousands of people are being ordered to evacuate. It's a rare reversal for the Food and Drug Administration. Commissioner Stephen Hahn has backed off his claim that an experimental therapy had provided a dramatic benefit to coronavirus patients. At a press conference with President Trump, Hahn had said that blood plasma from survivors of the virus could save large numbers of lives. Hahn now says he misspoke. The Kremlin's denying allegations that Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was poisoned. Russia says there are no grounds for a criminal investigation. Navalny is in a coma in a German hospital. Doctors there say tests indicate he was poisoned. Navalny's allies believe the Kremlin is behind the illness of its most prominent critic. As uh, David mentioned a moment ago, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is in the Middle East today. He's the most senior official to visit Sudan since last year's ouster of its Democratic leader, Omar al-Bashir. Secretary Pompeo is meeting with top Sudanese officials to discuss the normalization of ties between Sudan and Israel. He also wants to show U.S. support for Sudan's fragile transition to democracy. Secretary Pompeo is one of the featured speakers at tonight's Republican National Convention. He will be addressing delegates from Jerusalem. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Mark. Coming up, we talk with Energy Secretary Dan Briette about Trump energy policy in a second term. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. One of the starkest differences between Republicans and Democrats remains energy and climate policy, with Joe Biden pledging to accelerate and move away from emissions and fossil fuels started by President Obama and President Trump pursuing the goal of energy independence based in critically on use of fossil fuels. Welcome now the man charged with implementing the Trump energy policy is Dan Burrett. He's secretary of the Department of Energy. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being back with us. And I want to talk to you about Trump energy policy in a second term. But first, a couple of developments right now. Laura, a storm that looks like it may hit land down on the Gulf of Mexico on Wednesday and be a hurricane. Can you give us an update on the vulnerability of our oil and gas facilities down there? Sure. Thank you, David. Great to be back with you. Uh, we are very prepared for this hurricane that's uh, seemingly moving into this Houston, southwest Louisiana area. As you know, the Houston Channel is there. Port Arthur, big, huge refinery is down there. Several other important uh, pieces of our oil and gas infrastructure are down there. We have a specialized office here at the Department of Energy uh, that is uh, directed uh, by an assistant secretary that is responsible for our CAT response. Their teams are already evaluating this. We're working closely with the industry. 
we feel that the industry is very well prepared for this type of storm. In addition to that, the president has directed me to make available the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in instances like this. That's what it's there for. Uh, we are uh, doing all that we can to ensure that we are capable of doing that immediately following this storm. So we feel overall we're very prepared. Uh, at this point, we'll have to just watch and wait and see where the storm ends up. Uh, Secretary Regret, let's move out to California, where there have been these brownouts, basically power going down at various mm -hmm. times. Because it's been very hot, without a doubt, what's going on there? Is there some more fundamental problem? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. Uh, California has a long history of getting energy policy wrong. Uh, you, you may recall the, the blackouts, the brownouts from 2001. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a market issue back in that point in time where people were manipulating the market, but they were manipulating it because of the wrong uh, policies that chose uh, California chose to implement at that time. We're seeing some of that replay today. What California has decided to do is to move to a 100 percent renewable energy generation world. The challenge with that is that, you know, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, yet people want electricity, it isn't there. So their overall strategy is to borrow electricity or buy electricity from their neighboring states like Arizona and Nevada. Um, the challenge, you know, with that strategy is that when it's hot in California, sometimes it's also hot in Arizona and Nevada, and they may choose to keep their baseload power and keep their electricity because they'd like their hospitals to, to run just fine and air conditioning uh, to work there as well. So there's nothing to sell to California. And that leaves California in the awful position of having to turn off the lights in certain parts of the state in order to meet their, their energy needs. So that takes us to that fundamental fork in the road right now, at least between Democrats and Republicans, over renewables and avoiding emissions on the one hand and really relying upon uh, fossil fuels for energy independence that I described. Uh, right. At the same time, the Pew Center did a study back in June and said that 60 percent of Americans really are concerned about climate. I will say it heavily skews toward Democrats. Democrats and Republicans see this very differently. Mm -hmm. Can we have a bipartisan energy policy in this country? Sure you can. I mean, natural gas is a very clean source, and we're developing technologies here at the at the U.S. Department of Energy to make it even cleaner. We're also developing technologies to make, you know, carbon-intense fuels like coal even cleaner. And, of course, we always, you know, have had nuclear power for the last 70 years, which is entirely emissions-free. So, I mean, you can do both. You can have a renewable generation base, and you can have an emissions-free baseload uh, generation available to you. You just have to choose to do it. And I think that's what the fundamental problem is in places like California. They've relied too heavily or focused too heavily on renewable power like wind and solar at the exclusion of some of this baseload power, which you absolutely need in today's world to ensure that you have the energy you need when you need it. President Trump's administration has done a fair amount in trying to really, as I say, reinforce energy independence for the United States, relying in part, in significant part, on fossil fuels. What's left to be done if he's elected for a second term? What's on your agenda? Well, we need to continue to build out infrastructure. So, you know, as you and I have discussed in the past, we have done a great job in America of increasing our production, making ourselves energy independent, relying on new technologies or newer technologies like horizontal frack, horizontal drilling and fracking to allow us to increase production of, of these resources here in the United States. Our challenge today is actually getting the product to market. It's building out pipeline infrastructure to get it to the oceans, to get it to the coastlines. It's building export facilities so that we can make this oil and gas available to the rest of the world because they're going to continue to use these types of fuels for the you know, foreseeable future, perhaps as many as 40 to 50 years out. And I think it's important that as we do this, we maintain our posture in the world as the number one producer of oil and gas. And the reason we'd like to do that is because it gives us foreign policy options that I think you were discussing on your show just a few minutes ago. The whole notion that we are able to, you know, for instance, the Secretary of State traveling to Sudan today to perhaps normalize relations between Sudan and Israel to work on deals like the UAE and Israel. Those things couldn't have happened 40 years ago because we would have been afraid of the reaction in the Middle East and perhaps we would have endangered our national security by putting our oil supply 
at risk. We were entirely dependent upon them. The fact that we are independent today allows us to pursue these types of foreign policy op uh, options. Energy is important in our society for all sorts of reasons, but it also is the source of a lot of employment. There are a lot of jobs in the energy industry. And one place where the Republicans and the Democrats seem to be two ships passing the night is how we're going to create more jobs. We heard uh, former Vice President Biden say he's going to create millions of more jobs by going to green energy. We hear Republicans criticize his policy for saying you're going to lose a lot of jobs. Which is it? Aren't we adding more jobs and renewables right now than we're adding in traditional energy? Yeah. Well, I, I can't really comment on Mr. Biden's comments as part of the campaign. I'm prohibited from doing that. So I will, I will stay away from that. But what I will comment on is that, you know, when we look at the technologies that have put us at the top of the world in terms of energy production, hydraulic fracturing we just mentioned, you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce tells me that if we were to do away with that technology, we would lose approximately 19 million jobs over the next few years. And, you know, it's not a question of retraining those people and putting them into uh, renewable technologies. You know, certainly you can do that. And people may be forced to do that if you, if, you, if you do away with this technology. But the challenge with that, David, is that the, the salaries, according to the unions that we have talked to, the salaries in the oil and gas business are about twice what we're seeing in the renewable energy space. So it's one thing to suggest that you might retrain people and put them into a new role, but you're also giving them a 50% pay cut according to these unions. Fascinating. Just briefly here at the end, give us some sense of the investment you're making in new technology at the Department of Energy. Well, it's enormous. I mean, we're across the board. We spend about $16 billion a year uh, just in basic science, basic research that leads to these technologies that we just discussed. I'm very excited about what's just over the horizon with regard to advanced nuclear reactors. I think we're right on the cusp of not only smaller reactors, higher density energy sources for America uh, that will be connected to microgrids in some cases. We're also excited about moving perhaps even beyond fission energy, nuclear energy as we know it today, to fusion energy. So it's a very exciting world uh, that we're about to face. Is there a real prospect of fusion energy? People have been talking about that forever. That's true. Yeah, they have been. But we've made real progress. We've turned around some of the management issues around a large facility in France right. uh, known as the Eater facility. But we right. also have private sector companies here in the United States who have right. made tremendous advances. Yeah. Uh, General Atomic, several yeah. others out in California. They're doing a great job. It's fascinating. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. That's Dan Burrett. He is the United States Energy Secretary. Former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani has long supported President Trump, even serving as his lawyer. He's scheduled to address the Republican convention this week, and last night we caught up with him for his views on China and the pandemic. The last three months before the pandemic were the strongest ever. Uh, I think our economy at the upper level is always going to be cyclical. It's going to do well. Sometimes it's going to do even better. Right now, the stock market is remarkably doing very, very well. Uh, so what I was really impressed with was what he was able to produce in the area in which for the last 20, 20 years we've had, like, real concerns. We, we call it, like, jobless recovery, uh, recovery with wages not going up. Finally, we were, we were getting a recovery that had a lot of jobs and had very good wages. The problem with China, the problem with China is going to be one that we either are going to be able to fix or we, we may have a long-term issue in having to straighten out the whole relationship with them, uh, g given the fact that I think we, we, we kind of don't emphasize enough, they seem to have been very much behind this whole COVID uh, spreading throughout the world. It certainly originated there, and they certainly didn't give the information they should have been giving for the first month and a half, not just to us, but to the rest of the world. And that, that's a serious, serious problem, and it may be we're in a Chinese regime that's different than we used to think the Chinese regime was. We thought it was a regime that wanted peaceful rising. We may actually be involved with a regime that wants world domination. And uh, we've we'll, got to make a choice as to how we're going to deal with that. There may be some economic consequences to that, but long term, we can't be blind to the, to the fact that this Chinese government seems different than the Chinese government's that we actually negotiate a lot of these agreements with that did seem to have a strong nucleus of uh, people that wanted to have a peaceful rise. It seems it's somewhat different than that. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think a lot of commentators have said President Xi seems to be more assertive than his predecessors have been. I think a lot of people would take that point. At the, and there's no question that the virus started in China. At the same time, I'm not aware of any evidence, are you, that there was malice of forethought in this? 
No, I'm not either. I, I don't, I don't, I have never seen any evidence that they did this on purpose. I do very strongly believe that it did originate probably by neglect. And what about a realistic approach to COVID-19 at this point? It has not gone away, although right now it seems to be quieting down some in the United States. There's a lot of concern about a second wave. You've managed some very difficult circumstances, particularly when you were mayor of New York, including 9-11. Uh, if we have, in fact, sort of a chronic COVID-19 issue, we don't get the vaccine that people promised, but we can't be sure of. How is the best way to manage that problem for the United States, for its citizens, for its economy going forward? Well, I think, I mean, I think we've learned a lot from the last four or five months. And for example, Joe Biden, I think it was today or yesterday, said that he would follow the science and close down and shut down the country again if he had to. Well, if, if you understand the facts and the science, there'd be no reason to close down the entire country, even if it came back. We, we probably didn't have to close down the whole country. 85% of the impact was on people 60 years and older. The idea of closing schools was really unnecessary. And in fact, by focusing on the entire population, because we didn't know where the real impact was going to be. I think we lost a lot more older people than we should have. And finally, Mr. Mayor, uh, you said that if you just look at the record of Donald J. Trump, uh, he wouldn't be have very much trouble getting reelected at all. But there are other aspects to this, some of the ways he expresses himself, some of the tweets, things like that. You're close to President Trump. There are other advisors who are very smart, very wise, who talk with him. Surely you all must have said, if you just tone it down some, you'll do a lot better. You're making it harder for yourself. Why doesn't he do that? Well, you know, there, there, I, I work for President Reagan, and I remember when he lost the first debate to Mondale, and Mrs. Reagan said, "Let, you know, let's Ronnie, let Ronnie be Ronnie, and let Reagan be Reagan. We're all a combination of complexities." And at first, I used to get nervous about the tweeting, but I now realize that even though every single one of them doesn't work, this is a, a, a remarkable opportunity for him to communicate with his people, and since he isn't. Um, I think I'm understating this, the most beloved by the press, or vice versa. I'm not sure he gets a fair interpretation. So the only way he can really overcome that is by direct communication. And he's probably the president who has directly communicated with the public more than anyone else. And I'd argue that he actually has opened up a new way for leaders to communicate with their people. That was part of my interview with former mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, who then went on to be a close advisor and supporter of President Trump, including representing him as his lawyer. Coming up in the second hour of Balance of Power on radio, we're going to talk with a former Democrat who was a senator from Alaska, a former Republican who was a representative from the state of Wisconsin about this convention, as well as talk to Myron Brilliant. He's with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce about the foreign relations issues we'll see tonight. And getting to tonight... Program note tonight at 10 o'clock Eastern Time, we will be bringing you live coverage of the Republican National Convention. We expect to hear from the First Lady of the United States, Melania Trump, as well as Secretary of State Michael Pompeo being featured speaker. He will be coming to us from Jerusalem, no doubt to talk about that normalization of relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, even though there's some controversy about whether he should be doing that consistent with the Hatch Act. That's all coming up in the next hour and then again tonight. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio.